I'm Sam Legasic. And I'm Dreadful Dan Gallagher. And we're two old buddies that have lived our life at the edge of the mainstream. So come join us where things are a little odd. This is the... Hello, everyone, and can you imagine a world where you're simply doing your washing up and suddenly you're pulled down the plug hole by some kind of strange, largely formless organism. Your subcutaneous fat is dissolved along with your vital organs and your bones and you're assimilated into a large, what can only be described as, blob. (laughs) And maybe you're imagining a scene from the 1988 American horror film, The Blob. And if you'd like to know more about that film, then well, oddballs, Listen in. If it had a mind, you could reason with it. If it had a body, you could shoot it. If it had a heart, you could kill it. Now... Man is no longer the supreme being on this planet. The organism is growing at a geometric rate. By all accounts, it's at least a thousand times its original mass. Nobody believes me about what happened tonight. What did happen? You were there, you saw. Plasmic life form that hunts its prey. Predator. I want that organism alive. I think you ticked it off. The blob. Terror has no shape. Hi, everyone. Welcome to your oddcast. Uh, with me, Dreadful Dan G, and Sam, as always. Hello, hello, Sam, how are you doing? Hello, hello, I'm good. Blobby, it's Mr. Blobby. <laughs> <laughs> Another British reference. God, I tell you what, with the amount of American and Indian followers we have, they must love these British <laughs> <laughs> cultural references that uh, we constantly come out with. I think it's good that we get this out of the way, because the whole time <laughs> I was watching this film, I just kept imagining Mr. Blobby popping up from around a corner. Blobby, Blobby, Blobby! <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Blobby was an incredibly popular uh, character and a cultural phenomenon, actually, for a while in the mm. sort of early to mid-90s in the yeah. UK. He had a Christmas number one and, and everything. He was, like, unavoidable. Um, well, our mutual friend, Rich Keeble, has done a scene, did a sketch with Mr. Blobby. Can you believe it? Uh, it's a dream come true. Yeah. The Mr. Blobby. Um, but we're not talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're doing The Blob, um, which is a 1988 American science fiction horror film. Uh, it was co-written and directed by Chuck Russell, who also wrote and directed A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors, the best of the Nightmare on Elm Street films, I think. Um, so that was the year prior in 1987. He then went on to direct uh, The Mask, Jim Carrey, uh, the it's Scorpion like King, most. amongst right. others. Scorpion King was shit, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Master's um, cool. The Blob is uh, obviously a remake of the 1958 film of the same name, a real kind of like drive-in sci-fi Americana classic. And it follows a similar main plot involving an acidic amoeba-like organism that crashes down to Earth in a military satellite which devours and dissolves anything in its path as it grows. 
Mm. Sam, did you yeah. like the film? Did I like it? Um, bloody loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Had yeah. you seen it uh, before? Or was this like your first time? No. So I'd seen the original Blob, but like 15 years ago or something. So not really, don't remember that much about it. But um, certain bits stick out in the mind, especially like the cinema scene and all this stuff and whatever. Um but no, I hadn't seen this uh, version at all. So when you said I were watching this and I um, started watching it, uh, I was like, okay, oh God, here we go. It's going to be absolute shit. And then I saw Frank Darabont's name come up, who I think wrote with um, the Chuck guy yeah. on Nightmare on Elm Street 3 as well. I think that's how they met. <clears throat> and I was like, oh, Frank Darabont, I like his stuff. Cool, okay. And then as I was watching it, I was like, oh, man, this is just so great. This is like the perfect kind of, the perfect kind of B movie. And I don't mean that in a sense of like, Oh, it's so shit. It's good. Like as in, it's an actual, like for me, it's this in the same ballpark as like the thing or whatever, where it's, um, a, uh, it, on the surface, it might look a bit, how to put it like stupid almost, but it's actually got great characters, great story, shocking effects. Um, and, it, you know, there were like story arc, there were narrative arcs, there were character arcs. It kept moving, the pace was great. Um, and I was watching it going, this is brilliant, this is so good. And it's a nice, like, it's, and also like the main thing I enjoy about watching these films these days is they're like 90 minutes. Yeah. So um, you get, yeah. you're in and you're in and you're out properly. Um, and it feels <laughs> very satisfying. Um, so yeah, it was, I was really, I came away from that being like, that was great, really loved it. Great. Oh, I mean, I loved it as well, um, for all the same reasons that you've just listed off, really. Mm. And I kind of thought, why has it taken me until 2021 to see this film? It feels like it should be a huge cult classic. Um, I don't understand why that is. Because I honestly, like, I know there have been blob films. Um, uh, I, I, I think get that's them. a blob, sorry, there have been blob films. Is this one of yeah. your weird <laughs> sexual fetishes? <laughs> Blob films. Blob films. Blob oh um, No, it's in like they've been like blob sequels or whatever and things like that um, and knockoffs or whatever. And, it's, and I've just, if I've, I haven't even heard of it, but if I had it done, I would have just thrown it into like the uh, classic. They're just fucking, they've got something from the 50s and they're sucking it dry kind of thing. Yeah. I think that's what I, I've done for many years because I was aware of this film. Mm. Um, and it's only, I'll be honest, the reason why I thought oh, I'll watch it is because I came at the soundtrack. Okay. I can't remember what led me to the soundtrack. I think because I've been poking around some horror things and John Carpenter. I think mm-hmm. it was after we did John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll come to the soundtrack later on. But uh, yeah, I just think this is, is great. And I think originally it didn't do very well. So right. straight off the bat, it was a bit of a flop. Um Critical reception seemed to be okay, but the commercial response uh, was not good. Um, Wikipedia suggests it had a budget of $10 million and only made 8.2 at the box office. Fuck. Uh, Not sure how accurate that is because I've read somewhere else it had 19 million um, and that they spent 10 of that on the special effects. But, you know, basically whatever metric you look at it, the understanding is it flopped. Right. And it doesn't seem to have ever really rehabbed or recovered, despite efforts over the last however long it is, what, 30 years? Yeah. Um, 30 years. We're actually further away from this film now than this film was from the original Blob. That's true. That's, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know why it's not been remade um, since properly anyway, apart from the fact that it's got... A great title, which is also a shit title. Like no yeah. one now would go to see The Blob. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think that's part of the problem. A lot of people can't get over that premise because it's a yeah. very silly premise. Um, but like you say, it's executed to a really high standard. Mm. You know, they're fully on board and they're not mucking about. Like you say, it's uh, actually a uh, very quite violent film in a way. Mm. You know, yeah. there's no... oh. Oh, about to be attacked by a big blob. It's like, no, this is serious. 
something horrible is going to happen to you if this yeah. bulb get, gets hold of you. I mean, and that's the things that, like, when I compare it to the original, which um, I haven't seen in a while, but I just remember, I don't know what they used, probably, like, not, it wasn't jelly, but, like, I don't know, like, oh, it was jam, I think, which is kind of, there's a little joke, I believe, <clears throat> Kevin Dillon, who's in it, by the way, um, knocks over a thing. He's like, oh, look, it's just jam. I killed the jam or whatever. I think it's a little nod to the fact that they must have used uh, that <laughs> in the original. I don't know. But um, when you see that kind of blob thing, you're just like, it's just this fucking like liquid, just like pouring out. Whereas with this, they've made it really like like a muscle. Um, I think I read somewhere yeah. that it's supposed to be like an inside out stomach. Hence, it's like burning everything through acid or whatever. Um, right, yeah. It does uh, look like that. It looks absolutely revolting. Yeah, it's really horrible, but it's um, it's all like tenuine, tenuine, or whatever, whatever it is. And, um, sinewy. Sinewy, yeah, that's right. And it's like, it's just like this fucking bit, like all these different parts of me. And at one point, like towards the end, it looks like it, like another part just like comes out of it randomly. <laughs> like rather than like it absorbing, it's like it's re- like giving birth to like parts of itself or something. It's just, and there's just something very biological, something very physical mm. about it, even with all the fucking, C- uh, it was not CG, but with all the um, uh, effects that they've done with it, it just looks very real and a lot more um, human, basically, you know, yeah. way, in a weird way, rather than just some like sloppy jam. And that's what I kind of think of when I think of the blob or have done before this point, which is just like, it's just like a liquid that just basically swallows you up. Like, boring like it's the most basic lazy almost kind of enemy ever i don't know it's just something that's just like grows and it's just <laughs> like a, it's like whatever um whereas this feels like a proper living thing um that's yeah got some agency or whatever uh yeah you mentioned it's been nigh on 15 years or so since you saw that first film but mm-hmm. do you remember having a good impression of that yeah i remember thinking um it was i remember thinking it was better than what I thought it would be because um, it's Steve McQueen, right? Yeah. Um, and I remember thinking uh, he was good in it and took it very seriously. It seemed like for what was a bit cheesy um, in retrospect. Um, and I just liked, I like those kind of, you know, retro sci-fi films anyway. And this one I quite enjoyed. Um, it just felt a bit more like, uh, it's, it's like here's a person in a mask or whatever yeah or like an alien like you know the man who not the man who fell to earth that's David Bray the day the earth stood still yeah where it's like I'm an alien and here's my buddy who stands by my ship or whatever yeah it's like with this it's like this gloopy fucking horrible um thing uh that is just fucking weird I think there's a weirdness to it um yeah instead of being something humanoid yeah and then it always looks a bit hokey Yes, exactly. And I think yeah. I enjoyed that aspect of it because it's almost like it's so weird and silly, it makes no sense. And that's almost weirdly even scarier. Yeah. Um, More alien. Yeah. I really love the original myself. And of course, you know, when you read up on this, the debate that people get into is, mm, is the remake better? No, it's not as good as the original. Blah, blah, blah. They're both really good films. Um, I think they both have different tones. They're both obviously different eras. Um, this one being the 80s, you know, compared to the 50s, I think there's, there's a little bit more of a cynical tone. There's a mistrust of authority, yeah, obviously coming through. We'll we'll talk about that when we get to the characters. Um, but I just think, yeah, very different films, and why get bogged down mm. in comparing them? Um, but one of the things I always take away from that first film is, and I always think about it to this day. They freeze the blob. That's how they kill it. Yeah. They freeze it and then they dump it in Antarctica. So it will never thaw out. Right. Yeah. It will never thaw. Because if it thaws, it will go back on the killing spree. That was how the thing came about. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's it. You're like, but hang on. What if an Arctic Arctic mission goes out there? But I also think every year I see more and more about the the ice caps melting. (laughs) I don't think, oh my God, you know environmental disaster <laughs> literally the first thing that pops into my head is what about the fucking blob <laughs> <laughs> it's still out there frozen uh getting warmer by the day yeah by the second <laughs> um yeah i think the remake uh is more up my street i like the fact it doesn't 
it kind of is in the middle of being a bit hokey and yet taking it, not taking itself seriously, but yet taking its characters and the horror aspect of it very yeah. seriously. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, there's just so many bits of it that, um, that I liked. So one of the things I really like about the original is the setting of that American town. Mm. And I think what they've done here is is really good in sort of retaining that. It does feel like kind of quite cute in a way, like small town vibe. And it really reminded me, I don't know what you think of this, of Twin Peaks. Yeah. You've got like the nice coffee shop. Um, you've got some really like stereotypical American kind of characters. You know, there's the bad boy, there's the prom queen, there's the uh, the sheriff. But they all seem a little bit kind of like skewed and quirky and yeah. like slightly offbeat. And that kind of carries on throughout the film. And that's part of what makes it kind of fun, I think. Mm. Yes, that's Frank Darabont kind of all over it, um, which is cool. Yeah, it, it is very kind of, well, it's even got one of the same actors. What's his name from Eraserhead? Yeah. Um, oh, damn it. I've forgotten his name. <laughs> yeah, it's really annoying. Um, Jack Nance. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But he, um, but yeah, the, I just like, it's the way, so bear in mind, I'm going, I was going into this like fresh pretty much. And you've got those, it starts off with those choir shots of the, this little town and it's like dead. There's like no one on the streets at all. And at first I'm thinking, is this like the aftermath of the blob or whatever? And we're going to get some kind of weird flashback or something. And then you've got like the angels around and it's like, you know, you're looking up at the angels and it's now, you know, are they like protectors of this, of what's going to happen or, you know, don't know what's going to happen. And it's quite long as well. There's quite a lot of these shots and I thought, yeah, yeah, they're quite cool. And then later on, they actually do speak about like, oh, the town is a snow town and business is dried up or whatever. Um, And I did think about this, that intro sequence of like, okay. And then it goes to like a graveyard, um, which is, you know, and you're thinking, okay, death and all this, like they're they're kind of foreshadowing what's going to happen. And then it pans, has this really cool shot where it just pans across and you realise it's because everyone's at the fucking football game. Yeah. <laughs> the town is empty because everyone, it's such a small town, everyone just goes to this one thing. Um, it's great. It's yeah. a great example of how they play around with some expectations mm. of their audience. Which is constant and it happens throughout the film, um, which I suppose we'll, we'll go into later. But um, uh, yeah, like that whole small town, as you said, Twin Peaks-esque, like you've got characters and that's kind of the main thing uh, bordering on caricatures um as you said uh and yeah kevin dillon um as this like you know the rebel and you've got this cool sequence where he, he's like he, he's about to do his motorcycle jump over this bridge um which he he does later which kind of is part of his arc right he has yeah confidence or whatever yeah to go over this bit but um on this bit he's like drinking a beer um and then you're cutting to the football game with the cheerleaders and it's, and then he's cut, he's cutting in between it. So he's kind of revving up to go over the bridge. And it's, I was like, that's quite cool. Cause already it's like, you've kind of see him that it's almost as if he's picturing it um, for himself. Like he's a rebel, but he just kind of wants to be part of the gang. Yeah. He wants to be like, you know, have that same uh, jock kind of, you know, yeah. Um, respect i guess from other people which he just hasn't got um and even though like there's no one watching him apart from that <laughs> old old man and yet the jocks have all got all these like you know stadium full of people and cheerleaders whatever um yeah watching them there's kind of just having yeah you know, i wasn't sure if it was trying to like um if it's him trying to almost you know wish that was happening or whether it's just literally just showing the difference between these two lifestyles of these people within the town whatever then how rebellious he is by having it happen at the same time i don't know but um but yeah it's an interesting like intro for that character because he is shown to be like the bad boy outsider Mm. but at the same time he is embarrassed yeah falls flat on his ass and just has that (laughs) tramp like giving him a slow clap yeah 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 um and that's kind of like the way he's all kind of like fine about it as well 
he's not a dick, basically, which is the main thing. Like whenever he acts like a dick throughout this whole thing, it's usually you, he's got this thing of where it's like it's you feel like it's and it's cool. Kevin Dean could do this; he's done it before. Um, but you you feel like it's not him, basically. Like that's not the real him. That he's actually like a nicer guy than that. Which is why, as the events unfold, it's not it's him coming to like terms with like him being himself, basically, rather than yeah. living up to the caricature of this bad boy. He's actually yeah. not like that at all. He's like a he's a good, decent guy that's just been given like a rough life or whatever. Um, yeah. yeah. I felt the same. I felt like he did a great job um, of bringing that character to life and making him really relatable. And he just I warmed up to him quite quickly from starting off going, oh my God, this guy's such a dick. Yeah. Um, and that was helped uh, in no small part by his terrible haircut. <laughs> Extensions, I think uh, they were as well. Yeah, but that's going be like an 80s bad boy haircut. And it looks like something from the 70s. Shopping mall mum. <laughs> I think it, it looks like a member of like Emerson Lake and Palmer or something. Right. It's just really bad. It's like all fluffy and it's terrible. Um, apparently, a bit of trivia here, Sam. Apparently, that role was offered to Chad McQueen. Right. Steve McQueen's son. Yeah. Who I, um, who I know has been in... The Blob 2. Has he? <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I was going to say, I don't... I didn't know he existed, so... No, likewise. But apparently he turned it down on principle because he doesn't want to do projects that are too much like his father. So admirable, but at the same time... Career seems to have stalled. Now oh, fuck him. He's got enough money anyway. Kevin <laughs> Dillon was a better, better bear. He he does yeah. that kind of thing quite well. He's quite a Twin Peaks looking kind of guy. He, I mean, he looks what, exactly like he looks Bobby like James from Thingy. Oh, I thought he looked like like Bobby more than James. He's got that James look, vibe though, like yeah. going off on the motorcycle, looking all moody. Yeah, but he's like James was like I forget it's Twin Peaks here, but like James was like quiet. Like he was the quiet, like sensitive thing. Yeah. And, whereas Bobby was more like loud and like trying to be like the yeah. bad boy, but actually was kind of in love and all right at the heart of it. I think yeah. if I remember rightly. Yeah. So, yeah. That's my cut and also the hair. <laughs> <laughs> um so that's Brian, Brian Flagg. Mm-hmm. Um, like you say, kind of starts off as that bad boy. Um, but when we kick off the movie we're kind of introduced to this couple, mm. burgeoning couple. You've got Paul and Meg. Mm. So Paul's more like your kind of straight-laced, football-playing kind of, not a, not, not a jock, not an arsehole. Just like a a nice, heart throb. Yeah. And Meg's like the, I suppose, like the homecoming queen type character. Yeah, the cheerleader, um, head cheerleader, whatever. Like American girl next door, whatever. Yeah, so it's nice that all three of these are sort of set up initially as quite stock characters, but mm. then you kind of get to know them. But I really like the thing, Paul and Meg are about to go on their first date. Mm. And you get a, <laughs> a really good scene, I think, in The Chemist. Mm. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. So I think Paul's like nervous about buying condoms, so he sends his friend in to do it. And his friends, <laughs> I can't remember what he's like. He's gets embarrassed because the um, the reverend comes in as well. Yeah. And sees him buying them. Yeah. He's like, oh, they're not for me. Yeah. They're for that guy. He's uh, he's taking some girl out and... Uh, yeah, he's an animal or something. He's going, uh, come on, I don't want to leave this girl waiting. And he's just talking about generally, not like from a sexual perspective. And, he's, and they've just got this great shot where it's like he's saying that and the foreground's blurred and then it pulls focus and it's the other guy and he just turns around to camera as if to look at the pharmacist he's like gives this look like see yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fucking great that's so good but then um when paul goes to pick up meg and she's like come in and meet my father it's the chemist yeah it's a great funny little moment that. as soon as that paper was up i was like oh brilliant here we go <laughs> <laughs> it just goes ribbed <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, that guy's been in a ton of stuff. I was trying to, um, I, I should have looked it up, but like I recognise him from, I feel like he's one of those faces that's been in like every film. 
<laughs> like, I recognize ever. them. Um, and there's yeah. a few of those actually. There's a few faces which um, are really super recognizable. There's one like, there's one guy who I was like, where the fuck is that face from? Um, and I realized it, he's a Tim and Eric guy. Um, and oh, really? there's a Tim and Eric, you might be, the guys listening might be able to see it. But there's a Tim and Eric thing. I think he's like reading like a news thing, but he's been in a few things and he's like really hunched and he looks really fucking old. And he's like, Ugh, and he's all like scumped to one side. Like he's got what they call it when your spine's all fucked up. Um, okay. And I remember like when I see those Tim and Eric things, I'm like, oh God, that's a really, you know, I know they'd like to use these people and whatever. And, they, and you know, there's a whole thing about that. But um, yeah. And then when this guy, there's a, one of the doctor guys in the white hazmat suits that comes up later, um, I'm like, Sim, like that's that's who that guy is. Um, it's a really weird, uh, weird thing. But yeah, there's a few people who I'm like, I recognise these guys. I, I'm as well. What I didn't realise is Frank Darabont tends to use the same people. So the sheriff um, is a guy who goes on to star in The Mist. He then goes on to be in The Walking Dead, which Frank Darabont did to begin with. And then there's a whole legal battle with The Walking Dead of Frank Darabont and all this stuff. But um, yeah, it's all, all comes together. It's all part. It's all part of it. Um, yeah. Sorry. And it's cool seeing that. Yeah, it's cool seeing those faces like popping up. Mm. Yeah, definitely. It does feel like a like you said like there's an ensemble feel. I think mm. um, helped in no small part by the fact that we quite quickly start sort of like cycling through these characters as they get killed off. Mm. So Paul, who's been introduced to kind of set up to be probably like the, the hero, the main protagonist. Yeah, likeable as well. Because at first I was like, I was like, oh, here we go. We're going to side with the rebel. The rebel is going to come through and like, you know, either hinder the whole thing and be a dick or he's going to like at the last moment, like save everyone or something. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, when you get the jock guy and he starts getting involved with stuff, then you're like, oh, Mr. Nice, Mr. Do-Gooder. Um, yeah, he's going to see us through. But I wondered if it was going to be a case of like, oh, is he actually like, and he's going to be out for himself or something like that. He's going to give up his date and run off. Um, yeah. But no, like he acts like a decent guy throughout the whole yeah. thing. Until um, <laughs> we never find out if he was going to fulfill that, that character arc, Sam. Because he f- falls foul of the blob in possibly the most hideous scene of the film. Yeah. And it's great to get this shock in, I think, straight off the bat. Because I was like, holy moly, this film is actually going to be brutal. Yeah. Yeah, it's because up to that point, the blob's been like small. It's been like um, just a bit bigger than a fist or whatever. Um, And it basically ate a homeless person. And yeah. then, and that's when um, the next victim, yeah, is, uh, is it Paul? Um, yeah. And it kind of just, you see it like above him in this pretty cool shot and it just kind of falls on him, which is like, oh, whatever. Um, but you haven't really seen anything. There's no like body horror stuff yet or anything. It's, it's all been a bit like, oh, it's bits and pieces, but not really. It's just homeless guy. And then, yeah, it just cuts to this fucking scene where he... And I'm, and I'm guessing how they did it is this was actually him in some whatever, but um, he's stretching out and you'll see it because I think it's the most famous shot of the film if you like Google it. Yeah. Like his face, he's got his nose like pushed up. It's basically like when people um, get like, what is it, cling film or whatever and suffocate yeah. someone. It's like that, but it's all like in his mouth and it's just pulling him right, right back and he's got his hand out. And it's all like this pink slimy stuff. And then she's like, ugh. And then the next bit, his like end of Indiana Jones style, his whole face starts to like fucking melt away as it's pulled back. Oh. And I was just like, fuck. Like, this, is right, <laughs> this is right up my street. Because I thought, oh, it's just going to be like, they just like dissolve like fucking the witch in like Wizard of Oz or something in the water. Yeah. Like, melting. But with this, it was like, this, looks, this is fucking horrific. And it's relentless as well. Like every time there's a blob death it's always fucking disgusting yeah but this is a big first one and i it really set me up to like pay attention because i was like for one thing the hero's dead like you've just killed off the main hero like we've been stuck with this guy since the very beginning he was the first character we saw like he, he made some like cracky jokes about like will you go to the prom with me or whatever and all this stuff at the beginning nice guy we've had this little bit of to and fro these nice nice little like high school comedy moments or whatever yeah 
And as soon as the action started to go, and he's fucking killed off. He's fucking dead. <laughs> um, in a really, really horrible way. Um, but yeah, I thought it looked fucking great. It might be the best best bit in the movie, just for that reason, yeah. the fact that it's a shock that he's dead. And also just the way it's done, you're, it's immediately pulling the rug from under you going like, you, like, you want a horror film? Here you fucking go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so at that point, you know, then we're kind of like, okay, we've got Meg and basically Brian, the bad guy. Mm. And they start to form a sort of uneasy alliance. Um, and at that point, like the sheriff is introduced as more of a main character. And I, again, I thought at this point, okay, he's actually the main protagonist. Um, and he's going to, you know, he's going to sort this out. He's like a good old timey kind of, he's a good guy, going to get stuff done, take yeah. no nonsense. Well, I wondered um, if it was the the kids were going to do the kids stuff and the adults were going to do the adult stuff and it kind of yeah. meets up at the end, that kind of thing. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Ten minutes later, I think his uh, oh, but, sort of sort of girlfriend. Yeah. That's so hold on, hold on. Because, yeah, you've got... The setup is that, and this is what you were saying before, that he's gone into the diner right at the beginning of the movie there's this like really sweet moment with the waitress where he's basically asking her out in a very sweet way. And the dialogue here is really good. It's Frank Darabont's like cool writing, whatever. Um, and uh, she leaves a little and you're like, oh, okay, I'm, is he, is he, is he going to go out with her? Is he actually asking her out? Is she going to understand? And then she's like, I can't. And he's like, okay, cool. I get it. And then she writes a little note, like I knock off at 11 or whatever. He's like, okay, he's in. Um, and then he kind of hassles the bad kid, but not properly. Um, and there's some other bits and pieces. And then basically the next time you see him is, um, yeah, sorry. I just kind of need, felt like I needed to set that up because yeah. it was a real fucking, you're expecting it's like, oh no, because there's the waitress and you know, and now it's attacked the fucking cafe and she's yeah. there and, you know, he's going to have to save her because you know he's coming because he's going to meet her to go on this date. You know, yeah. he's on his way so she- there. So he's going to, he's going to save the day, right? And she's on the phone, she's in the phone booth, and that thing's like surrounding the glass. Yeah. And you're like, but she's on the phone, she's gonna get through, and they just go, No, he's left, he's on the way to the diner. Yeah. And just a second after that, you just see his grey, ashen, bloated face. Yeah, like half drift of past it off. The glass. Ah. Uh, but the best bit is you see his eyes moving. Oh. <laughs> so he's still alive. He's still fucking alive. Um, oh, that's horrible. And yeah, and you just think, fuck, like the fucking sheriff's dead. Like <laughs> people just fucking dying. And then she dies straight after yeah. in a really fucking cool shot. I don't know how they did this. I think it must have been um, uh, like a dummy they put in there as her. I, well, it must have been. Um, and maybe, I don't know, maybe they did some miniature and just blew it up or something. But you can kind of see it surrounding it, leading up to it, as, as we said. And then it just kind of explodes in and just like, poof, like just kind of surrounds it. And it's a really cool shot. Um, that really stuck on me, actually. Um, and yeah, like people are just dying. So like at this point, you're just like, well, no one's safe. Like and now, like throughout yeah. the whole film, I'm thinking, well, they'll just kill off anyone at any point. So, and and they do, to be honest. Um, yeah, really good, really great. And I'd, I'd argue that, is it Pam, the girl? Uh, Meg. Meg, sorry. That she um, is the, that it's her, she's the main, almost the main character of the film. Um because I think at this point, at this point, the focus then goes on to Megan, bad boy Brian, mm. and she starts to emerge as the as the hero, as the protagonist, mm. as the the action hero, right? Yeah, because they kind of go off and uh, they kind of split up. I can't remember exactly what happens, how that happens, but um, and they're kind of doing their own thing. So he's like noticing because they come together, and it's like these fucking guys in suits turn up. And they're like, oh, cool. And they kind of give a bit of background, like, yeah, we're here to, like, investigate stuff. And she's like, oh, okay, they're the authorities and we're okay. And Kevin Dillon's like, they haven't even got a fucking logo. You don't know who these fucking guys are. And that's a good, that's the thing of, like, her, like, he's not just, like, a rebel. And he's like, he goes, like, oh, I just don't like authority or whatever. But he's making her question yeah, like almost be almost grow up like that coming of age thing, which is a great yeah. arc that she has, where she becomes just like, oh, I don't know, kind of like cheerleader 
like numb nuts almost um but you've already seen that there's like hidden depth to her she's like really nice with the old man and all this stuff and uh, the homeless person they pick up and everything and you're kind of on her side as she sees the guy die her boyfriend and all this turning into like a woman where like at the end she's fucking got a machine gun yeah. and all this stuff and i'm just like yeah that that was cool that was a really good like character arc of how she's very quickly just um gone with the flow she hasn't like scuppered or anything she's kind of just gone full hog into it the same as kevin Dillon does but um he kind of goes from like what would be like a selfish outsider to saving the town um, yeah and that's kind of his journey almost like becoming one with the town again and just kind of not having to feel like he has to be like a rebel or whatever just yeah. to accept himself i guess i don't know and it's really satisfying because yeah i genuinely really warmed to these characters mm. like we said um kem dylan did a great job i think shawnee smith as meg was really really good as well right I um, she's been in i know do you know what i've seen her in an episode of the x files oh really which one Always bring the conversation back around to the X-Files. Well, I've just been watching it, like literally today. So um. Um, It's an episode called Firewalker, which is actually quite an unmemorable one, I think. Um, but she's good in that as well. She plays a very different type of character. Firewalker, which one's that? It's about a, a research team that are looking into some strange things in a volcano. Oh, yeah. And it's I got, think um, he goes mad. Yeah, it's got the guy from uh, West Wing and all that and get out um he's the yeah he's the main kind of antagonist that actually isn't the antagonist um he's the She's genius like a, you know they're like oh he's a yeah. genius that's the west wing guy he's been in tons of stuff um she plays like a young researcher who's come along for the ride right. and it turns out that actually they're having a relationship so she's very naive and uh vulnerable yeah, and yeah, I she does. Her. I know you're really good now. I don't remember specifically her face. I know the character. She looks really different, but yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think that Meg, that character arc, it seems quite a common one of films of this time. But like I'm thinking, I think is aliens. That, <laughs> yeah, two years later, um, a remake of Night of the Living Dead, mm-hmm. where they flip it, and Barbara is the one who kind of like toughens up yeah and like literally tools up with guns and stuff yeah that's and right like becomes yeah. a sigourney weaver-esque ass kicker because mm. that's what so surprised like me the, about the original night of the living dead um because yeah. i saw it after the remake i really i think and i was like oh she's like uh soggy tissue like she's not doing anything um, yeah. her character was yeah in the remake she was i like, think that i think yes. wet blanket might be the uh common expression no, is it I think soggy tissue is something that you've I've been picked up from your own, uh, <laughs> your own your <laughs> own habits. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. Sadly true. Looking at Sean Sean E Smith, um, which isn't who's not someone in the blob. It's just a guy called Sean. Um, yeah, no, I say like wet tissue or something. Just like the fact that it just breaks apart very easily. Maybe wet blanket is the expression. <laughs> I've turned it into tissues. <laughs> I've made it even more <laughs> disgusting. Um, um, sorry, but yes. Uh, yeah, she's um, a cool character. I think it's just interesting. There's a lot of these, like, you know, uh, tough kind of female characters in films of this t- uh, time. Um, and also, just think, I should have mentioned this earlier, you know, there was this uh, basically pattern, I think, of, of remaking these old 50s and 60s sci-fi films. So... I think like 1978, you had the remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers that seemed to have kicked it off. Obviously, John Carpenter's thing. Yeah. Uh, The Fly. Yeah. Um, So then you get The Blob. And like we said, 1990, you've got Night of the Living Dead. Mm. Um, So I guess, you know, the reason they were making these is they were probably box office successes. So this must have been a real disappointment. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. I don't mind it when, um, you know, they kind of take, I suppose it's for us, how like people started doing stuff more with like the CG is really good. Um, so yeah, you know, we can do like Avengers, <laughs> we could do comic book heroes, um, better now than we could have done in yeah. the eighties or whatever. Um, it's that kind of thing. Take something and 
punch it up a bit, but you can. But at least with this one and with the thing, well, and the fly, to be honest, is that at least like the stories um, are still great and they still yeah. work and they're engaging and they're not just like, it's like we've got better effects, but we're not necessarily reliant on them. And to be honest, the blog yeah. is like a bit hit and miss. Like there was some, the physical stuff was really good. There was some of the green screen bits, which I was just like, oh, that's awful. I remember this one bit, which always made me laugh um, always. Like I only saw it the once, but like, which made me laugh, which was the, um, where it slaps down on like someone and then it lifts back up like Roger Rabbit style with like the person like flattened <laughs> and just stuck on it like a bit of paper, like they've just got 2D. Um, uh, yeah. That was really weird. Um, there was one bit as well, which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> It's just like there's that guy with there's a load of little weird funny bits um like with the 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 um the black doctor guy when he falls down the manhole or whatever and then they just like all these like colleagues just like shoot him or something as he's like down there i can't remember <laughs> and then there's one guy who um has his grenades and he pulls all his grenades off and the blob just goes on top of him and you're like okay here we go it's gonna like explode it or whatever and then kevin dillon's running along and in the background, you just see the, these little like fires like underneath the blob, and you're just like, oh, "Fucking hell!" There's like no stopping this thing. Well, by that point, they've already established that it's cold. Uh, it's kind of scared. Of yeah. Cold. Um, yeah. But yeah, the effects are amazing. Like you say, some of that blue screen stuff lets it down, mm. but generally, they're pretty incredible. Yeah. And I think, you know, at the end of it, I was I found myself wondering, can Hollywood studios actually even pull off this kind of thing these days? Is that a lost art? Because if you did that in CGI, it would not look as good. No. I mean, it's it's so tangible. Mm. And like you say, it, it looks like a, at times it looks like an inside out stomach. Mm. It looks so organic, basically. It looked like the thing. Like it looked like it's the, I, mean, I think it's a different person who did it, but it's very much of that ilk of like, yeah. F- of, of an art of someone that's it's not a computer guy that but it's like someone who's physically sat there and spent a lot of time making this work and experimenting and doing it again and doing it again and making sure that you know it's ready for the take um and all this stuff and it yeah it's just and some of the stuff like there's loads of little bits um which uh i think you know you would probably forget unless someone showed you but um like, you know, pulling, well, in that bit where she's like trying to pull his arm and his arm just like comes off. Or like there's one bit where she picks up a woman in the cinema or something and she just takes her oh, off yeah. the floor and the entire like half of her is just melted. Yeah. Um, and there's things like that where it's just like fucking hell. Like it's physically horrific and just it doesn't pull any punches with it trying to, um, it, it's there to like shock and make you feel disgusted and be like, fuck, this is like, melting flesh um that's kind of going on here yeah don't watch this while you're eating angel delight yeah (laughs) Yeah. um there's one other character that interested me i wanted to see what you thought about the priest yeah reverend (laughs) mika he's great (laughs) he's such a weird looking guy i swear when he came on screen i was like i must have seen him in something else he must have been he's got such a great face there's no way he could have just been used in justice film or whatever um yeah, he was quite interesting because he plays like the kind of the classic like alcoholic priest who's, um, you know, all like do goody, but not really. And he's just like so creepy looking. Um, it really adds to it. And yeah, that kind of, so at the end, basically, so what happens is they freeze, they're able to freeze the blob and they it shatters into a million bits and they kind of scoop it all up. Um, and it's supposed to, it's like this kind of Christmas style um thing where it's like there's all snow falling which is actually whatever it is liquid nitrogen or something yeah <laughs> the sky, which would surely burn you um through being so cold uh and it's like a little like festive weird horror like oh christmas miracle or something like that which is great and it also feeds into the thing that they were talking about and they mentioned it on the, in the in the actual film which is like they needed snow to come this year to like save the town or whatever um, oh yeah of course and the snow has come even though it's artificial um and uh yeah and all that stuff and then it cuts to the basically the priest guy in the middle of nowhere like as the leader of some kind of like religion or cult or whatever or maybe it's just like just normal jesus stuff but he's talking about the end of days i believe or whatever 
Yeah. And what you realize is that earlier on in the film, he had been picking up like little shards of it that yeah. had frozen over in an earlier scene. And um, uh, from the ice cabinet, which is where we saw that it was afraid of the cold in the first place. Um, and uh, he's kept it in a jar. And now it's like an, it's a thing. It's another new blob in a jar that's quite, you know, sets up. Well, not sets up a sequel. It's more just like leave it on a cliffhanger kind of thing. Um, yeah. Even though the story's resolved. And I was like, man, it's really weird because they've made him look even creepier, even sleazier. He's got his like disgusting, like long hair. He's got his eyes all fucked up. He's got half a face or whatever. Yeah, because he gets burnt quite badly at some point. Mm. And yeah. so now he's like, oh, yeah. It's disgusting. Like, yeah, they didn't need to do that. But for some reason, I was just like, it's nice because it kind of fills in the world a little bit more. Um, yeah. And that character as well. Um, not necessarily like, oh, they're trying to set up a sequel. I don't think they necessarily were, and they didn't. Um, more just like, I felt it was to do more with that character that you feel like he was fucking weird to begin with, and he's ended up weird, and it's an actual threat that he's like some fucking weirdo that's out there with this thing. That's it, yeah. It just feels like a little, like an Easter egg in the film, basically. Because yeah. he gets introduced in that scene that we discussed in The Chemist. And you kind of think, oh, that's that's his purpose fulfilled. He was just there to be the priest that makes him feel a bit awkward for mm. the benefit seconds. of that joke. Yeah. But then he pops up again um, and starts, like you say, a bit, he seems a bit weird. Mm. And you're not quite sure where he's going. And then every time he pops up subsequently, he just seems more evangelical and a bit mad. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, it's just a nice little sort of like uh, epilogue at the end of the film. Mm. That idea that, yeah, maybe he's going to facilitate the end of the world. Yeah. With his little shard of blob. Yeah, his little tiny blob, blob guy. Um, Day of the Tentacle. Yeah, yeah, literally. <laughs> it is. Um, yeah, I guess as well, it's like part of it, I liked the whole, um, the fact that the, it felt like the film was like kept changing in a sense of like it started off with a bit of a comedy. Well, it started off those initial bits like as, okay, it's going to be some like horror, apocalyptic horror or something. And then it turns into like high school comedy and then a little bit of like a cheesy monster horror, then like kind of body horror. Yeah. Um, and then goes off on this kind of like thriller, like chase, slasher almost style where they're trying to run away from it and even the little kid i forgot about that the little kid in the sewer you're like she goes back to save you're like thinking and i remember like when she was going back thinking well usually they're pretty dead by this point but you know i understand she's gonna try and then he comes out the fucking water with his hand out and he's just just fucking like half melted it's horrible and she's like fuck this (laughs) come out of here um yeah just, yeah, that was a real. If if you didn't, if you hadn't quite cottoned on to the the direction of the film by that point, that was really like we are going for the jugular with this movie. Yeah, no one's safe. Exactly, and then it's got the whole like conspiracy government thing, and then it turns into like an action film, um, and the whole thing is just some kind of weird sci-fi. So it's like it feels there's like a lot of variety in what yeah. you would kind of classify as like a monster flick or something yeah that's a nice summation actually of all the like yeah fun subgenres all jostling around in this blobby grab bag yeah um you touched there on that government conspiracy subplot Mm. um actually before we come to that just we've we've touched on it really but yeah basically like you say after um the sheriff's been killed and everyone's been running around Mm. town the blob's been killing people getting bigger um, they happen upon, but Meg and Brian happen upon these guys in hazmat suits up in the uh, mountains in the hills. Yeah. I've seen from Chit Chat Online, quite a lot of people actually uh, disliked this tacking on of a, of a subplot about the government conspiracy. Oh, really? Obviously, this wasn't part of the original. In the original, it just uh, crashes down from outer space. Um, but, yeah, we... Um, it was revealed that the blob is actually a result of government tests. Mm. I suppose it's like Cold War-esque uh, weaponry. Yeah. Um, well, they say that and, in it, don't they? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And so this is just a, a, a made me think of like Return of the Living Dead. Yeah. You seen that one? Yeah, yeah. Love that one. <laughs> Where um, basically it's like, yeah, this is just, this is a test on a town. And actually, you know, we well, the, want to contain the threat, but we're not bothered about the people of the town. You know, it's, it's, it's more important that we have this weapon that could preserve the lives of millions of Americans than worry too much about preserving the lives of a couple of thousand people in this town. Well, isn't Return of the Living Dead that they open the wrong canister or they open yeah. the canister in the first place? And then at the end, the government are just like, Drop a bomb. bomb the whole town. Yeah. Fucking kill them all. There's one bit, I know we're going off on one, but we're talking about, well, actually it's all relevant because there's one bit in Return of the Living Dead, which is that fucking weird melty skeleton monster thing, which always sticks yeah. with me, which reminds me generally of how these guys melt, which also reminds me of a, the guy who is in the blob, who is in Robocop, you know, the sheriff's deputy or whatever, who gets bent backwards in half and pulled out the door in a really great sequence. That's him. He's the melting man didn't twig. in Robocop. Um, I didn't twig that. Yeah. Of course he is. Yeah. Oh, of course he is. So there's a connection of melty people right there. <laughs> that stayed with me. Like, I watched Robocop as a kid and that just stuck in my head. Mm. That image of him just, that car going through him like yeah, a like hot nothing. knife through butter. Yeah, exactly. Splat. Um, but uh yeah i i quite liked this subplot i thought like i said you know this is a more cynical age that's been through you know um been through watergate you know it's been through jfk being assassinated Mm. you know we don't trust the government anymore and it seemed like a, a fairly actually realistic and viable explanation for where the blob could have come from that it's just a a, a weapons test. Yeah, um, it's like a thing of like what's scarier, like the thing you know or the thing you don't know. Um, yeah, and I guess in that respect, it's usually the thing you don't know. But it's in the sense of like, uh, you know, when it's like there's a horror element, and it's like, oh, it's supernatural, or is it just some really fucked up individual? And sometimes the scarier thing is it's that's a fucked up individual. Um, yeah, and the fact that it's like, oh, it's just come from space, so there could be anything out there to like, no, we did this. But I think from a coming from a writer's perspective, um, I felt that the government conspiracy thing, when you see them turn up, um, and bear in mind, you think, I think they play it so that you think it's like a UFO or something to begin with, where the light's coming up or whatever. Um, yeah. You automatically feel like you're in safe hands. So in fact, you're a bit like Meg in this route. You're like, oh, the government's here. They're going to clear it up. So yeah. like, there's like a safety net element with it. And again, that gets pulled out from under you because you realise they're the bad guys and they're active bad guys. They're not just like, we're trying to cover it up. It's like, we're actually quite prepared to kill all of you and yeah. shoot you and do whatever. Like, it's a big thing. Yeah, they escalate, don't they? Yeah, they're just like... To the point where, I think when they when they trap them down in the sewer and just leave them to die, I think that's the moment where it's like, whoa, now they've really stepped over the line. Yeah. They are... They are proper villains. Yeah, and drive over the fucking um, sewer. Over the manhole. The manhole yeah. so. Um, so well, I yeah. thought it was all quite x Filesy. y is, yeah. Um, it does feel like that. But I like the fact they put that twist on it and it's, you know, it makes it less hokey, less like it came from outer space, um, but like an experiment gone wrong makes it feel a bit more tangible, um, yeah. even though it's ridiculous, obviously, as a concept in the first place. But yeah, for me, I was just like, in terms of the story, I like the fact that it's like, oh, the government are here. And he's like, we don't know who these people are. <laughs> like, they, they, they could fuck us up. And then you realise that they're actually just bringing another problem um, to the table mm. rather than a solution, which kind of makes the threat even, because now you're dealing with a human threat. Same as what we yeah. talked about in a lot of the games. <laughs> it's about, but it's in like, <laughs> the humans are sometimes more dangerous than the you know, creatures or whatever. Um, yeah, so I think it was, I think people are getting hung up on the fact of like, it was a conspiracy, we made it ourselves. And it's like, it's not really about that. It's more the fact that we've now got an added um, dangerous element here that we mm. thought was safe. So it's mm. once again turning, I mean, it depends, like a lot of these things, like a lot of the government stuff, it's like they're not necessarily on the side of the good or whatever you think of. E.T., I don't know, <laughs> or, 
or something. Um, I was getting yeah. strong ET vibes at this point. Yeah, um, but it was good. And the bit and that kind of <laughs> what I really liked as well. And they, hey, he does this so well. It's really great casting. Is that the um, the like black leader guy? He's all like yeah. very friendly and you know f- feels very like warm almost and you realize very quickly he's actually like a cold-blooded fucking killer like a real nasty bastard Um, yeah and so again it's subverting expectations um and that's why i liked it that's why i liked about the whole film it's great it was just like it kept me i kept expecting it to be like the original or something of that ilk or just a standard like here we go, going through, plodding through the same motions. And each time it surprised me, even towards the end, I was like, I'm still getting surprised. Um, yeah. Which That's is a great thing. thing to be able to say about a film, especially when it's 90 minutes long. Yeah, exactly. Um, any other final thoughts on the movie? I guess, like, um, for me, I wonder, like, what is the blob? And not in a sense of, like, you know, what is it? But, like, I'm trying to think of it with, like, a film theory hat on. And I wondered if it was, like... I don't know, I had some, had some thoughts, but like America, like being this like all consuming blob basically. And I thought the fact that these little towns, especially one that's reliant on like snow and all this are just getting fucked over by um, general consumerism and like, uh, you know, mass population. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, <laughs> I can't, I can't think of another word than um, consumerism. Um, yeah. The fact that it's like the town's dying um, and uh, and part of the reasoning for it is the fact that it's the cold that kills the blob because it's the cold that kills the blob, but it also saves the town, which is like the snow saving the town because it can start getting people back. Um, if that makes sense. There's something in there, basically. Um, and I probably haven't put my finger on it properly. but uh, Like a small town versus... Global consumerism, global market. Yeah, I think specifically... But basically, yeah. that's the threat, and they're able to thwart it by banding together as a as a community. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the one thing that keeps the town alive is the cold, the snow, or whatever, that brings in the people and the economy. Mm. And that's what defeated the blob. Um, but yeah, that was my only thought about it. There's probably some other theories out there, but that was just kind of when I was watching it. I was Interesting. Like, okay. And that's why it kind of starts. I was like, that might be part of the reason I think I said earlier, but why it starts with like the empty streets and all this stuff. Like this is the result of like eighties, um, excess yeah. or whatever. Cause it feels like shots that you see in like old news documentaries about those kind of like, uh, you know, places like Detroit, working towns where the industry has died yeah. because everyone's been moved out. Everyone's gone to New York or their um, their trade has failed yeah. because people are buying stuff from China. China. That China. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I can see that, actually. Mm. But, yeah, that was, that's my, interesting that's my take. thought about um, the blob, if I was taking it you know, from a serious angle. <laughs> what about you? I didn't really have any further thoughts. I think I, I've said everything. Um, I think it's a great film. Mm. And I think, like you said at the top of the episode, if you just want to see a basically a B movie, mm. you know, an unabashed B movie that is done very well, you want to get a bucket of popcorn and just have a good time, switch off. This is like really high grade, I think, mm. drive-in kind of stuff. Really good fun. And yeah, I, I just don't know why it's not uh, more widely known. Yeah, well, let's get it there. Yeah, people should go and watch it. Did you ever see The Mist, Frank Darabont's The Mist? I've seen The Mist. I presume it's that version. Is it? Was it made like in the mid-2000s? Yeah, with Thomas Jane. Yeah, I've got that actually on DVD. Yeah, so that's I really enjoyed that when that came. I out. liked it as well. Um, and I recently, um, I was thinking oh, I want to see the black and white version. Um, oh, let's do it. Yeah, because it's supposed to be basically a lot of the CG is a bit shit and cheap. And yeah, it kind of gets covered by black and white. I want to say that's how he initially wanted it to be, like Frank Darabont. Um, so yeah, I've been interested in doing that, but it's the same kind of, like, he's just really good at like characters, um, 
and story. And that's basically, you know. That's yeah, because the mist, so great. it's the same thing. With it. It's actually that the, the monsters or the threat mm. are secondary to an exploration and study of the characters mm. that are put under pressure. Exactly, yeah. And especially yeah. with the mist because you're all stuck in this one room and the fact that different things break out and there's some great casting in that as well. But yeah, um, anyway, not to go on about that. Oh, the blob. Well, let's add it. So let's, let's do the black and white mist at some point. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Let's see what other people said on the internet in our reviews. Internet, sure. I hate it. Um, a lot of positive reviews, but I think, you know, we've said a lot of good things about this film. So yes, here's some let's focus stuff. on the on the bottom end, the bottom of the barrel. Um, I've got one here. Two stars out of ten from IMDb. Disappointing. And mean. <laughs> the plot keeps you interested throughout. Too much of the action takes place either on the mountains or in the sewers. The killings by mountains. the blob get to be boring. The mountains. It's a bit of forest or a park. <laughs> yeah. Not the fucking mountains. It's like the... <laughs> I know. Uh, up in the Himalayas. What is she talking um, about? I particularly disliked this time around that some very good people get killed. People I thought would be around trying to nail the blob. Oh, it's almost as if <laughs> you know, they're trying to do something a bit different. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, just, um, just want to point out, you can't nail the blob. The nail will just pass through his <laughs> gelat- gelatinous being. It's, true. it's not an effective uh, approach to destroying the blob. If anyone's listening to this podcast in the future... Because the Earth has been invaded by a blob, well, and maybe you've been looking future. for solutions to tackling it. Yeah, then that's my only bit of practical advice: don't try and nail it, freeze it, freeze it, or burn it. But apparently, burning it doesn't do any good. Might might make it worse. Might expand. Might just antagonise it. Might might blow into little bits, and then they become little blobs, and they grow. Um, no, you wanna, awful. You want to contract it? That's right. You want to freeze it. You want to get the particles closer together, not further apart. That's the science. Less kinetic <laughs> energy. <laughs> the last killing was particularly unnecessary and annoying. What's the last killing? Which one was the last one? I, I can't remember. I really can't remember. Probably some one of the guys in the hazmat suit, surely. Maybe a child. Oh, I don't know. Guess the producers had a very mean streak in them with all these killings of good people. <laughs> good people. Still, like the ending though. <laughs> oh, well, worked out well for her in the end I've got one three stars out of ten the blob is out of place in 1988 mm. um, I was trying to watch the movie as though it was still 1988 my childhood years but I didn't like it the blob was just so corny I'm picturing he's sitting there like in his thunder cat's pyjamas yeah. like, trying to recreate the experience of yeah. the 80s <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. That would be fun. Maybe I might do that myself. <laughs> yeah. Get my like A team lunchbox out. Teddy Ruck's bin. Don't <laughs> dust him off. <laughs> I think the only thing cornier would be the attack of the killer tomatoes. That is a terrible film. Uh I mean, who thought a gelatinous mass of red goo would be a credible monster? When I think of a good horror movie, I think Will thoughts of this monster keep me awake at night? And after having thought that, the answer was a resounding no. <laughs> I love the idea that this guy's criteria for a good horror film is, will it keep me awake at night? <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's not... He's gone to the wrong kind of thing. You want a disturbing movie. You want something yeah. that stays with you in that case. This isn't, this isn't yeah. going to disturb you. Yeah, watch something genuinely disturbing like The Sixth Sense. <laughs> it's disturbing for other reasons that's if you it's only disturbing when you watch that film and then you see Harry Joel Osmond as he is now <laughs> that'll disturb you he's in the new X-Files did we talk about that is he? yeah he's in one of the episodes he's when, he's when his Skinner goes back to check on his Vietnam mate who's also played by Harry Joel Osmond and he plays him and the guys <sighs> um, I remember now yeah 
And he's just so broad and thick, real <laughs> chunky guy. <now. laughs> With a terrible, uh, terrible actor, but yeah, did when I was a kid. A blob wouldn't even make a cameo appearance in my mildly unpleasant dreams. I'm just not frightened without by the idea of my cherry jello eating me or dissolving me. Apparently, this was a remake of a 1958 film with the same title. Apparently. It could be false. May- <laughs> yeah, could have just checked. You're on IMDb. Yeah. You could just quickly check. Um, maybe, this is great, this theory. Maybe in 1958, there was a story going around of a kid whose chewed up bubblegum came alive and ate him. So the movie had some type of credibility. Credibility. That's what he's looking for. He's coming to the blob going, I need some credible stuff here. <laughs> So yeah, in 1988, after having seen Halloween, Exorcist, Poltergeist, the blob just doesn't belong. Yeah. Weird. He's been desensitised. Um, my favourite review here, four stars out of ten. Mm. What the hell is with Kevin Dillon's hair? <laughs> Really, what is with that hair? <laughs> I think this movie must have been made during that brief period where white people tried to have afros. His head looks like a mop. It looks so weird. His hair could be the blob. <laughs> Other than that, this movie had some really awesome death scenes, yeah. mostly of people getting broken in two by the blob. It's An not excellent mostly, horror that, that movie. Happens, but yeah. Yeah, generally they don't get broken in two. They just sort of dissolved and assimilated, right? That's what mostly happens, yes. <laughs> An excellent horror movie for late night watching. I just can't get over that dude's hair. <laughs> Riding around on the motorcycle, all cool. Wouldn't anyone tell him how ridiculous he looked? I don't get it. Wouldn't you just go into hiding after doing this movie looking like that? Or well, that was probably intentional. Just makes the movie more entertaining, I guess. I mean, he's got fucking the Tears of Fears haircut, really. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, wish I could respond to that. I wish you can. You can't reply to people's reviews on IMDb, but I actually feel like this person would be a lot of fun to watch a film with. <laughs> I mean, I, it wasn't that distracting. I didn't find. I just like saw it. I was like, oh, that's bold, and then I just kind of got used to it. I couldn't get over it either because I was like, that isn't an 80s bad boy mullet. You know, that's not... Think about like Kiefer Sutherland in Lost Boys. Yeah. That is a bad boy 80s mullet. Yeah. This looked like yeah, fair enough. I'm the keyboard player in a yeah, like North London rock. mid-70s prog band. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I can, I can see. I can see that. I can see yeah. that. Anyhow, those are the reviews. Um, now I would like us to be ushered into Nerds Corner. Oh, okay, let's go. So Nerd Corner, I mentioned at the beginning of the episode that I kind of like came upon this movie because I was listening to the music by a chap called Michael Honing. Um, so this came out on CD and cassette in 1988. And yeah, I think it's a really good soundtrack. To my ears, it's it's pretty sort of like carpentry, right? Uh, not the carpenters. I mean, John Carpenter. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's kind of a bit of like modern classical with electronicy, ambient darkness. Okay, um, I don't kind remember of thing anything was... about the music. I don't remember anything uh... about it. So, um, if, I don't know. Maybe I have to go give it a listen then. If it's if it's good, it it's probably a good thing, right? The film. Yeah, I mean, that's probably a good thing that it, in the film it's not overly noticeable. It's just there doing its thing. But I think, yeah, when you listen to it, I quite enjoyed it. Okay. I, I enjoyed this sound anyway, yeah. Um, but anyway, it came out in 88. And then it got a CD reissue in 2011 um, with a really ugly cover. Um, but then 2018, it made its first appearance on vinyl on One Way Static Records, and they put out loads of different pressings here. Mm-hmm. And they did, like, really limited. So I think the most common one, there's only 400 copies. Right. Which they gave to Light in the Attic, uh, Mondo, and Transmission for distribution. Mm-hmm. 
Um, they did one 200 copies only for Zavi in the UK. Yeah. Um, a few others, but yeah, these are really cool. And I think as well, you know, they've had fun with the color schemes here. You know, because it's the blob, you've got a lot of pink and purple stuff. Nice. Um, yeah, if it wasn't going to have pink, and, uh, well, and purple, I suppose, but yeah, you think they're missing a trick there if it wasn't bright pink <laughs> fucking vinyl. Yeah. <laughs> There's a cool one here purple translucent with pink opaque splatter. Okay. Looks horrible. Right. In a good way. Right. Um, the Zavi one's a bit boring. It's just block purple. Um, the best one, pink purple swirl. It really looks very blobby. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think probably it's on Spotify if you want to listen to that music. Like I said, if you like John Carpenter, that kind of thing, um, some like 80s synthesizers, then uh, yeah, go and check it out. Hmm. Yeah, um, you know, I literally don't remember anything about about it. But um, yeah, if it sounds a bit John Carpenter-ish, then great. All for that, all for that. There's another music connection. Mm. So I know you said, oh, you're aware of some other Blob sequels. I think there's only one. Oh. Um, 1972, Beware the Blob. Yeah. Which That's is really, yeah. Is there, there is also... TV, TV movies on the Blob. No, maybe not then. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. Maybe you watched Beware the Blob on TV and that's confused you. It's highly possible. <laughs> um, it was also known as Son of Blob. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I can't believe, sorry, going back to Mr. Blobby. Yeah. I can't believe the son that of they blob. didn't do some kind of Blob parody on uh, Noel Edmonds' house party. What? I mean, it just, it's just asking to be done, surely. Well, yeah, the slime. Mr. Blobby going around just like absorbing people into his being, like some kind of vile pink blamange like vampire. Um, yeah. God, he's <laughs> such a weird looking... I remember even at the time it was like, this is weird. What a weird thing to do. And it just it really did take off, didn't it, in the UK? Yeah, I think if, you, if children that were slightly younger than us probably didn't question it, just liked it, but I was of that age where I was like, this feels creepy. Yeah, what is and this? He's quite scary. And he's the problem is that he is unrelenting. Mm. He's unrelenting. But it's just pure slapstick. So for people who yeah. don't know, I can't believe we're talking about Mr. Blobby again. <laughs> it's just a weird, like, Google him, you see what he looks like, and he literally just goes around going, blub, 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 but it's all like, He's an idiot. Like, he's making a mess everywhere. He's doing X, Y, Z. It's all, like, falling over in this massive foam suit. It's just pure... But he attacks goodness. people. That's right. He yeah. attacks people. And people go, that's a bit too much, you know. He's got his big, like, rubber latex hand on someone's, like, face. And they're like, all right, pack it in, Blobby. Um, but no, he'll always go that step further. You're not like, trying to hug you and pull you to the floor or whatever. I can't remember. Yeah, he, Consent is no issue for Mr. Blobby. Oh, my God. He's just, he just takes what he wants. Anyway, look, Beware the Blob, a.k.a. Son of Blob. Beware the uh, Blob. It was made in, well. <laughs> made in 1972. Um, it's the only film, I think, uh, directed by Larry Hagman of uh, Dallas fame. And he stars in it as well. Um, apparently, it is bloody awful. But the reason I bring it up is because the soundtrack was by The Blobs. <laughs> the Blobs, which was an alias for um, our old friend. Oh God, here we go. Who? Any guesses? Walt Garson. Of course. You know. <laughs> Jesus. How could I how could I have got that? Who who would have thought? <laughs> And uh, the full soundtrack wasn't released, but there was a seven-inch single with uh, two two tracks. Um, and I think bits of it have been compiled recently on some of the releases, uh, anthologies, right. the Mort Garson. So, yeah, nice little bit of trivia there for you. Yeah, it's interesting. Blob Garson, someone I never heard of before this, uh, <laughs> before we started this podcast. Um, cool. Uh, good film. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, go out and see it, everyone. Mm. Track it down. Yeah. I guess that's um, it. What are we going to do next week? Um, next week is music. So I think we're doing um, our weed, our bin, we are Evo. 
Devo, indeed, indeed. And we are going way back to the pre-record contract days to look at some hardcore Devo. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're a fan of the band, <laughs> um, I think that's going to be fun, kind of digging into some stuff that's uh, not really been explored and discussed as much as like the, you know, their first album or Freedom of Choice. Mm. Um, but yeah, if you're just an interested person in like post-punk, weird esoteric music, it's some of the weirdest music uh, that I've ever heard. You know, their first album really is a big step away from that. Uh, this is really unusual stuff. So prime oddcast material. Right. I love Devo. So yeah, I'm looking forward to giving it a listen. Um, cool. Cool. Well, I that's it. I hope you uh, all come back next week for more oddcast. Yes. Until then, thanks for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>